Dr. Andreas Koenig um, from Stony Brook University. He is a biological anthropologist slash primatologist um, who does some very cool stuff and he'll be sharing about that today. A um, couple quick announcements. Uh, we will continue our tradition of having the reception over at the terrace immediately after. And if you haven't seen the Evos cakes yet, they say that the one from tonight is going to be awesome. So <laughs> please do join us at the terrace immediately after, um, and we can talk with, uh, talk with Dr. Koenig. Um, and on April 7th, uh, Alex Bartholomew of our own geology department will be talking, and there will be the um, Evos barbecue immediately after that. So that's right, I said Evos barbecue. So that's going to be on April 7th. Um, Dr. Koenig comes to us from Stony Brook University. Um, he is professor of anthropology. He also has the formidable position as associate dean of arts and sciences. Um, he has a PhD from Gottingen University in Germany. Um, he is an expert on various non-human primates, um, has studied extensively their social and behavioral patterns, and uh, will share some of his research, research with us today. He also has um, the interesting position of being the incoming director of a program in human evolutionary biology, which will soon start at Stony Brook. And this is a major um, that is cross-disciplinary, related to evolution, and is very similar in spirit to the EVOS program. And we're very looking forward to the growth of this program. And Please join me in welcoming Dr. Koenig. Thank you, Glenn. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, the EVOS program is a very interesting program. It's very innovative and um, it's very important, I think, to bring evolution to uh, many people. Okay, so today this talk will be about non-human primates um, and our closest living relatives. And um, it's not a talk about human behavior. There's a little bit of human behavior in here. There's a link to human behavior and I hope this will become clear why with this link, why it is also important for humans to understand non-human primates because we can learn something from them for, um, about us. Okay, so um, our closest living relatives, um, if you look at them, they demonstrate an incredible diversity. So there's, um, as shown here, this is only a small selection of non-human primates, right? And um, this is the order of primates has about, depending on the taxonomist you're talking to, 250 to 750 different species. And they're showing a really large morphological variation if you look at these pictures. Um, but for us, important today is that they're not only morphologically variable, uh, but they're also socially variable, right? So you can see here these examples. You can see some lemurs here. You can see capuchin monkeys, howler monkeys, Francois langurs, Hanuman langurs, rhesus macaques, baboons, gibbons, uh, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos. And they live in various different uh, social systems. And so let's start with a, with a simple fact about primates. Primates are the most social mammal. Um, most of them live in groups. And to put some numbers to this, if you look at primates, uh, across primates, 73% of all the genera of primates live in social groups. If you look at other mammals, um, then you have only 13 to 32% of uh, these mammals live in groups like these uh, Asian wild dogs uh, that they are hunting, living in groups, hunting in groups. But this is an exception among the carnivores. Uh, this, many animals live in bisexual groups, but primates are actually year-round living in association with um, both sexes. 
So in addition to this being the most social um, mammal, primates show an incredible variation in uh, their social systems. So there is variation in social organization. By social organization, what I mean is the group composition and size. And so you have um, animals that live solitary, like these orangutans. So you see here a female with an infant, so they're not completely solitary, but there are no females living together or no males living together in orangutans. Then you have uh, species that live in pairs, right? So like these, um, like these lepilemur uh, from Madagascar. Uh, then some species live in groups with one adult male and several adult females, like these Francois langurs, or you have groups like these baboons where you have multiple males and multiple adult females living together in a group. In addition to this variation in social organization, you have variation in other aspects of the social system, in social structure, by this I mean the pattern of relationships within these groups, what the relationships are between males and females, between females, between males, and you have differences in mating systems, so the mating pattern and pattern of reproduction. If you want to talk about all these variation in primates, this would take a whole semester of teaching. So for today, we'll focus on one particular question among this variation, and this is the question of why um, there are many primates where you have multiple males within a group. So why live in groups with multiple male, males? And this will deal primarily with this primate down here, Freire's leaf monkeys, and not only because this is my study species, but uh, this is also because we found something in their social organization and mating system that makes us believe that this sheds new light on the variation in social systems among non-human primates. Um, okay, so to approach this question, um, why live in groups with multiple males, uh, let's start with some fundamentals, fundamentals about biological approaches to social relationships. How do relationships among females differ from relationships among males? That's a question for you. What's different between relationships between females and between males? Any idea? Well, um, look at those. So um, the main difference is that often, and I'm saying this often, not always, often, uh, the relationships between females are relatively friendly. Whereas on the other hand, relationships between males are quite often combative, competitive, more competitive than between females. And that's not only true for primates, that's also true for humans, right? Um, and after all, we are mammals as well, right? So on a very general level, the question is why are there these differences between males and females? Why are male-male relationships very often competitive and intolerant? So this competitiveness and intolerance is often expressed in fights. Frequent fighting is shown here for baboons, for gelato baboons, and here between stump-tailed macaques. Um, and this results frequently in injuries. Um, and just to point this out, this is part of an ear um, from this male. So this results quite often in injuries and sometimes even in death, and I'm not showing the death here. So why is this so different? Why are males and female relationships so different? The fundamental difference is that um, for females, usually food is a limiting resource, right? So of course males have to eat as well, but for females, their reproduction is really depending on food. So the more food they have, this increases the reproductive output. It changes the, the frequency of reproduction for females. Now for males, that is different. 
they, of course, as I said, they have to eat as well, but for males, the, re the limiting resource are usually receptive females. Um, for males, the question is, how many females can they find and mate with? And this is restricted in populations because females are not always able or willing to mate, and this is largely due to gestation and lactation. And this will skew the operational sex ratio within a population. So operational sex ratio, if you don't know the term, it just means um, that this is defined as the ratio of sexually receptive males to sexually receptive females. And um, this is the question of how many males are willing to mate, how many females are willing to mate in a population at any point in time. So why is this um, operational sex ratio skewed? Well, the reason is uh, that only usually few females can conceive at any point in time. Um, so imagine if you have primates. Uh, in some primates, a female can give birth every year, once a year. In other primates, it's only every fifth year. And if you take orangutans, it's only every nine years. So there's a huge long period of time in which a female is either gestating or lactating and she's not mating. So if you come from a perspective of male, maybe there are 10 females in a group and there are probably only three or two that are willing to mate at a point in time. The others are tending to the infants. So this is why there's a skew in operational sex ratio and that makes males more competitive. But there's another issue here. There's another catch. So if you look here at um, these females eating, they're sitting in one resource. And this resource can be shared. So food as a resource, not, not all food, but many food resources can be shared among individuals. So far, nobody has come up with a possibility of sharing fertilizations. A fertilization cannot be shared. So if there's only one ovum, then this cannot be shared between two males. So it's only one winner uh, among two males. So these two aspects uh, are behind the fact that male-male relationships are often very competitive and intolerant. So for males, it often doesn't make very much sense to have another male around, uh, because if there's another male around in a group, then they might have to share a non-shareable resource. So if the other is the winner, then they can't fertilize. Right? So the best, male, the best a male can do is to try to prevent access of other males to a group. And in such a situation, if a male is successful, then you are ending up with this situation in um, what is called a one male unit. Um, and so this is a sketch here. You see these um, pink monkeys. These are the females, and the blue monkeys are the males. So you have one male and multiple females in a group. And then you have some surplus animals, some additional adult males that are not in a group. So you have, on the one hand, the have, the male who has a group of females, and then the have-nots, males who do not have access to females. But if a male is unsuccessful, if a male cannot keep other males out of a group, then you're ending up in a situation where you have multiple males and multiple females together in one group. So you have, in this sketch, you have multiple blue uh, individuals and multiple pink individuals. So you have a multi-male unit. Now, important is here that this is not a dichotomy between two systems, but these are the ends of a spectrum. Right? So you may have populations where you have some one male groups and then you have some multi male groups. And you may have groups with two males or three males or four males or five males or more. Uh, the question becomes then, what determines the number of males in these multi-male groups or the number of males in these groups overall? And this question, what determines the number of males, has been determined uh, both empirically as well as um, theoretically. 
and it's quite simple. The number of males depends on the number of females. So the number of, so up here, number of females, the more females, the more males. It's a very simple, straightforward relationship. And this was first, for the first time shown in 1999 by Charlie Nunn uh, in a paper in Behavioral Ecology and Social Biology. And um, as he showed here in this paper, there is a, there's a lot of noise in there. <laughs> uh, but there is a relationship, a positive relationship between the number of females and the number of males. And this was redone uh, in 2011 with a study of 71 different primate species. And again, it was found that the major factor that determines the number of males in a group is the number of females. So if there are few females, a male is able to defend this group of females against other males. If there are many females, then it's impossible for one male to really uh, keep all other males out of this group. Now, in such a system, if you have this system where males compete over access to females and defend these groups of females against other males, then there is little room for males tolerating each other. Right? Um, I can give you an example. Um, I studied for several years Hanuman Langers in Nepal, and they live in this kind of a system. Um, and during this time, I saw one time a male touching another male. Right? So otherwise, contact between the males was only when they were fighting. They were staying at the different ends of a group. They didn't like it or each other. They went out of their way to not meet the other guys. Um, so in some situation, like here in these baboons, you may find that there are coalitions between males. Right? So here you see one male, this male is soliciting this male to form a coalition against the third male. You find these coalition even in this system, but they are very short term. They are not long term. They're not really friendships or something like that. They're really only very short term. And so this system has a name. It's called female defense polygyny. So everything has a name in anthropology or biology. So this one has female defense polygyny, and it basically means that males try to defend groups of females and uh, if they are successful, you're ending up with a one male group. If they are not successful, you're ending up with a uh, multi male group. So males are together in a group not because they choose to do the so and because they like it, uh, but because they can't prevent the others from coming into these groups. Now, this system, female defense polygyny, is the most common mating system on, among non human primates, right? Uh, but wait, didn't I just say that there's lots of variation among non-human primates in social systems? So if there's only this one system, then there's not much variation here, right? This is indicating not much variation, not much flexibility. So do primate males never bond or have friendships with other males? Uh, do primate males never form long-term coalitions? like these guys. Right. Well, um, actually, some primates do. And um, we can't go through all the different except exceptions or the different examples. And I've chosen the two examples that are really important for this talk today. There are two examples. And these are chimpanzees. Chimpanzees form long-term bonds. So they are communities, there are, there are primates out there where males may form long-term bonds. And then there's another system here. This is uh, the Thomas's Langers. Uh, Thomas's Langers have so-called age-graded relationships. And these two systems are different, different from the female defense polygyny, but also different um, if you compare them to each other. Right? So, Let's first briefly talk about the exceptions to the rule, number one. And this is the cooperative resource defense polygyny. Um, this is the system, how it's called. And in this system, males usually defend territories. Right? 
And um, this is very different from what we had before. In female defense polygyny, males do not defend resources, they defend females, right? They defend females against other males. Now, in, in cooperative resource defense polygyny, males defend territories. They defend an area in the forest or wherever they are. Now, this could be a single male. Um, this happens in birds, it happens in horses. But in primates, these are usually multiple males that together defend an area. And that's why it's called cooperative resource defense polygyny. Um, now, in this situation, a male tolerating other males might be beneficial because through the size of the coalition, these males might be better able to defend a better area or a larger area and so on and so forth. So this might lead then in the end to have more resources, to have better resources, which might lead to more females, might lead to better reproduction and so on and so forth. Um, this is not to say that these males, when they cooperate and defend an area against other groups, that they are not competitive, right? So they might be competitive against other groups, but also within a group, they might be competitive. Tolerant in this situation does not mean they're always their big, the big friends, but they might be also competitive. But it's easy to be cooperative against a common enemy, and that's something we know from our own experience. Uh, you can bond with somebody who you do not like if you go against a common enemy. Now, this system, as I said, called Cooperative Resource Defense Polygyny, was originally supposed not to occur in non-human primates. Originally, people uh, thought this is occurring in some animals, but it's not occurring in non-human primates. The common paradigm was that, well, in primates, males defend females, they don't defend food. But since um, a few years and some years now, there is some kind of a hesitant acceptance that maybe, yes, maybe chimpanzees represent such a system, right? And even since some three, four, five years, since a few years, perhaps even some other primate species might exhibit this kind of a system. Now, here with this kind of system, with the cooperative resource defense polygyny, we are very close to humans. Because if you look at traditional human societies, there are quite a bit, there's quite a number of traditional human societies where you have a similar system. Uh, you have coalitions among men, and these coalitions among men um, defend common property, defend a territory, defend resources. And as an example, I have given here the example of the Tokana pastoralists. Um, if you have never heard about the Tokana pastoralists, um, the Tokana, um, what they do, the young men, they go out with their guns and uh, raid uh, other communities. So especially in the Tokana, they go across the border from Sudan and go to another tribe and raid the cattle and bring back 100, 200 300 cattle, and then they distribute them among their communities. And these are uh, relatively large coalitions, several, sometimes 50, 100 men that are not related to each other, or they are unrelated and related men. They're coming from different uh, villages together, and then they go over and raid these other uh, communities. Um, so here you have a system where men jointly defend resources, or in the case of the Tokana, they go and get resources from other places for their community. So they have a sort of tribally sanctioned cattle raiding. Um, in such a system, resource defense polygyny, be it man or be it chimpanzee males or other animals, the very big question here, the sort of 900 pound gorilla in the room, is the question of collective action and the collective action problem. So what's happening here in this system is there are some members of a community that do something on, in behalf, on the behalf of the community, 
and uh, they defend the territory, they, they may raid cattle. This is a dangerous undertaking. If you take the Tokana, men die in this undertaking, right? So this action may benefit their community. So why do these males cooperate? Because they, this is very dangerous. And it's not guaranteed that in the end, they benefit from this action. So why do males participate? Do all males participate? Are there no free riders in this system? So let's see if somebody is willing to sacrifice. If somebody's going out and raiding cattle, um, I could stay back and get the benefits. So I could become a free rider. What prevents me from becoming a free rider and what maintains the cooperation among these males? So this question of what makes male cooperative resource defense polygyny working or ongoing has implications also for humans. Because in several known cases in human societies, we have exactly this kind of a system. OK, so this is one exception. Then we have the other exception, and that's these age-graded multi-male groups. Um, age-graded multi-male groups um, is, in its core, a little bit similar to female defense polygyny, because males defend females. But here, the mechanism is different how these groups come about. So what you have, usually you start a group with a one male group. So you have one male defending a group of females, and maybe another male comes in and kicks him out. So there is a system of one male units. But sometimes males tolerate other males. And these are usually, or supposedly, the sons, the maturing sons. Right? So a male hangs on to a group one of his sons matures, and then it becomes a two-male group. And maybe another male matures, and then it becomes a three-male group. And so there are maturing males that can be staying in the group of uh, their father. And this is how these multi-male count groups come about. Plus, what is important in the system is the number of males does not depend on the number of females. Um, now, in contrast to, resource, uh, to female defense polygyny, in these age-graded multi-male groups, you have so-called tolerant relationships between males. Remember before we said that in a female defense polygyny, the males do not really come together. They do not like each other. They fight each other all the time. Here in the system, if you have a multi-male group, then the oldest male tolerates younger males in this group, his, presumably his sons. Uh, and so there is some kind of tolerant relationships between these males. You still have a dominance hierarchy. A dominance hierarchy in the sense that you, you can find male ranks and that you have the oldest male, supposedly the father of the other males, on top of this hierarchy. So why do these males tolerate these younger males in these groups. So why do these groups become multi-male? Well, the idea is that tolerating these younger males in a group, you have a stronger group, you have two males or three males who can defend the group better against maybe predation and certainly against other males who try to take over this group, right? And so, this can lead to a male holding on longer of a group. Usually, if you take, for example, the Hanuman Langers, uh, a takeover in a group happens every two or three years. So maybe this male can hold on four years, five years, six years, instead of only two or three years. Now, this system has been suggested previously for various different primates. Uh, particularly those mentioned down here. So gorillas, silvered leaf monkeys, Hanuman langurs, Thomas's langurs, and uh, spider monkeys. And this goes back, and you can see down here, this goes back to a very famous science paper 
uh, from 1972 from John Eisenberg and colleagues. <clears throat> and they suggested that this is one particular mating system among primates, um, and these were the uh, five species that they suggested live in this, um, sign, in this uh, system. Now, uh, more recently, some colleagues, um, Lisbeth Stark and Jan van Hof, have suggested that there is a um, sort of phylogenetic component to this, that um, some primates from Asia, some leaf monkeys from Asia, live in this um, age-graded multi-male units. So they suggested that um, species like gray langurs, so there are various species of gray langurs, mostly in South Asia, India, um, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, um, those species live in female defense polygyny, whereas the other species down here, the genus Trachopithecus, and these are the Lutungs, and the genus Prospitus, these are Sorilis, that they all live in um, age-graded male groups, multi-male groups. Now, um, this is basically the starting point for my research in the field, because when I read this paper, I thought, well, there's so little evidence for this. Um, can we really go and study a species in Trachopithecus or in Prospitus and see what kind of system they live in? And so we selected this species, Freire's leaf monkeys, um, and we thought, well, we want to find out whether they live in age-graded multi -male units, and we want to know what are the benefits of tolerating additional males. If this system really exists, then we want to know what the benefits are. So this species could be either live in one male units and age graded multi -male units, or alternatively, it could be like uh, Hannibal Langer's live in female defense polygyny. So this one, this age-graded multi -male units, was a suggestion from Stark and von Hof, and I didn't really believe that. I thought maybe they are more like female defense polygyny, and uh, long story short, uh, we found something different, right? And this is what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, before we go to these results, uh, let me briefly introduce you to the field site where we did our research and that's the Phuket Wildlife Sanctuary in Thailand. Um, and just so that you understand, this kind of research you're not doing on your own. So um, I'm standing on the shoulder of many other people here. Um, so this kind of field research is not done like 30 years ago, there's one graduate student going into the field, but there are multiple, nowadays this is a undertaking of many, many people, and I'm putting all these people up here in order to say thank you to them. And the important part is here, this research started in the year 2000. We started collecting data in January 2001, and it went until January 2009. Okay, where's Pukyao? Um, Pukyao is in the northeast of Thailand. Um, so right here where the red star is, there's Pukyao Wildlife Sanctuary. It's about 1,600 square kilometers in size. This is a pretty sizable, pretty large area. Um, here you see a topo of the area. What you can see here is here's a table mountain, and here's a rugged mountainous area, and here's our study site between the headquarters here and the entrance of this sanctuary. And just to show you the red here in this picture, this is a satellite image. The red in this picture is forest. So it's um, forest, this area, with few exceptions here. And of course, if you leave the sanctuary, then everything is rice paddy. Right? So there's not much forest left. But there are big forested areas in Thailand. Thailand does a really great job in protecting some really major chunks of forested area. Um, so this area where we worked in was uh, more or less accessible. Um, less accessible if you look at this area here. This is really a mountainous area which uh, goes really high up in elevation. Uh, we mostly worked in this lower elevations. Um, and you can see here lots of trails. 
uh, that were marked. And these trails are made by elephants and forest bison. So we didn't cut many of these trails. Mostly these are natural trails that were in the forest. And if you um, don't know how this feels, if you are in the forest with elephants together, then you should check this out. This is a video that some crazy field assistant took. And normally you should not stay if you see elephants in the forest go, go somewhere else. Right? Uh, but this, uh, you actually can see here markers um, where the trails are marked. So this happened in the marked area and these elephants come through and then if you see the elephants then uh, you find another place. Um, and if they are right under your monkeys you want to observe, then you go home and come back another day. Right? So you call it a day then. Um, okay, so you can see here there's this little one as well. Uh, so this is a dangerous situation. You really should not do this. Okay, um, we have chosen Pukya Wildlife Sanctuary as a study site because it has an incredible diversity. Uh, incredible biodiversity, not only in plants and in birds, but also in terms of carnivores. There are 30 carnivores in the area. And this um, sanctuary alone has eight different types of cats. So we have clouded leopards, golden cats, leopards, and tigers. And we have additional for smaller cats, uh, jungle cat, fishing cat, marble cat, um, marble cat, and leopard cat. So there's incredible diversity. And this is important for us because this indicates an area where you have a rich predator community that can prey on our monkeys. And we have actually witnessed marble cats taking, um, taking out juvenile uh, leaf monkeys. And we know from scat samples that um, clouded leopards, those guys up here, that they prey on monkeys. Uh, along the same lines in terms of predator community, um, Bukia Wildlife Sanctuary um, harbors two species of pythons. Um, so you have reticulated and Burmese pythons, and you see up here, this one was sitting at a waterhole for several days, waiting for prey to come to the waterhole. This one has something, I don't know what, inside, and this one is actually right now eating a pigtailed macaque, so a monkey. Um, so these are the general conditions, just to give an expression, impression how this looks in this forest. Uh, we studied this species, Spherus leaf monkeys, Trachypithecus spherea crepusculus. Um, and in the very beginning, um, what we saw from the monkeys in the beginning uh, looked like this, somewhere far. Right? So they were leaving and going away whenever we came closer to them. And it took about a year to habituate the first group. And altogether, we habituated uh, four groups to our presence. Um, Ferris leaf monkeys are mostly arboreal. They are mostly living in the trees um, most of the time. And you haven't, if you haven't seen them, detected them, there are um, eight spots with monkeys. And here's a female with an infant. And here's a female with an infant. So they're, they're up there in the trees most of the time. And most of the time, you're looking up and getting a stiff neck. But sometimes. Um, Luckily, they come to the ground. They come to the ground for drinking and for soil eating, like in, this, uh, in these examples. Uh, <clears throat> the diet of these leaf monkeys consists of um, mostly leaves. So they're called leaf monkeys. Not surprising that they're eating leaves. So 46% of their diet is leaves. But they're eating also a sizable amount of um, fruits. These are mostly seeds. So 40% of their diet um, is seeds. Now, as I said before, the data collection started in January 2001 and went until January 2009. And what you usually do, what we usually did, was dawn to dusk observation. So we tried to find them at their sleeping site and then um, uh, went the whole day until they were, went to sleep. Uh, this went over uh, many years and lots of observation time. Uh, when we were with the group, um, we always took GPS data to, to map uh, the whereabouts in the forest and also their travel routes. And this is important if you want to know something about their home range and whether how they're using their home range. 
In addition, when we were with the groups, we collected data on birth, immigration, death, disappearance, immigration. Uh, so in order to get an idea about the group composition, the social organization of um, these monkeys. And then we, of course, did behavioral observations. And these are either group level observations or individual observation. Now, you might ask me, how do you do individual observations? Well, you get to know the individuals, right? Um, and you can distinguish, if you are trained a little bit, you can distinguish these individuals very easily. Uh, so they have differences in the crest, in the eye rings, in the muzzle, in the belly pattern, in the tail. I'm not showing the tail, but if you look at these five females, if you look at the eye rings, if you look at the muzzle, if you look at the crests, they have different muzzle patterns, they have different eye rings. And then they have down here, uh, below the belly button, they have an area, this is depigmented skin. This is really pinkish skin. And the area is different from, from monkey to monkey. So it's kind of like a fingerprint that you have here on the belly, and also the muzzles are like fingerprints. So if you have multiple markers, you can really pinpoint individuals, and once you detect an individual, then you can follow it and observe what it's doing. Uh, so now you're knowing a little bit about um, what the actual work. Now, what is the answer to this question? Do Freire's leaf monkeys live in age-graded multi-man groups? So um, for this, we can make several predictions, right? So behavior studies, even though I know some people won't believe this, but behavior studies are actually science. You make predictions and you test predictions. And so we can take the suggestions for age graded multi groups and can say, OK, what do we expect if these would be age graded multi groups? So we should find that in a population, you have one male units and multi male units. And you should, in addition, find that the number of males is unrelated, not depending on the number of females. OK, so what did we find? Um, we look here at the data from the four study groups that we, are, that we observed. This is kind of a sketch how they were distributed in the forest. Um, and so you have these four different groups. And if you sum everything up that we had in terms of data, then you have about 20 individuals per group with a range of 3 to 33. Um, here it's shown how many adult females and adult males are living in these groups. Right? So most of the time we had one adult male, but then we also had two, three, four, and five adult males in these groups. And then a range of three to 12 adult females. So altogether we have on average two adult males in these groups, ranging from one to five, and about, let's say, 50% of the time, we have these groups are one male units, right? Um, and then if you look at the number of males and the number of females, then you really find that there is no linear relationship between the number of males and number of females. So there is a slightly, well, if you call this a slight positive, um, but in reality, the best fit is really a covalinear relationship, right? So, the number of males does not depend on the number of females in this population. So basically what this means is that the two first predictions about age-graded multimod units are fulfilled. So this is what you would expect for age-graded multimod units. Okay, so you can make more predictions and you can talk about male membership changes. So male membership changes means that we should expect that natal males, when they mature, should stay for some time after maturity in their groups, in their natal group. Also, if you have one male units, you should expect occasionally takeovers, that a male from outside comes and kicks out the old male in that group. Um, and for this, I have to say that we can easily distinguish, well, kind of easily distinguish age classes between males, among males. So, Juvenile males, and this goes mostly by size and development of the testes, right? So uh, juvenile males do not really have testes. They're relatively small. Uh, 
subadult males are about the size of an adult female. So this species has some sexual size dimorphism. Males are bigger, adult males are bigger than females. Uh, and then if you have adult males, we actually distinguish young adult males and adult males. But if you have adult males, then you have the full body size and fully developed testes in these males. So <clears throat> how did this group change, these groups change over time in terms of the number of males? So we wanted to look at whether males, when they mature, stay in their natal group. Right? So here, just to explain this a little bit, this is the number of males on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have time the different months, and you see how many males you have in these groups, right? And so here in this group, you have one adult male, and then you have a subadult male on top in, in addition, and then you have two adult males, and then you have two adult males and, and a subadult male, right? So here you can see the development, and what you see is this, that in three of the four groups, we have subadult males maturing in this group and staying in this group. Right? But they did not only stay in these groups, they actually later reproduced in these groups. Right? So it's not that they, are that they are maturing and then after a year or so leaving. No, they stay there and breed. Um, in addition, what is important to note, I spoke before about takeovers. We have never seen a male takeover group from outside. We have never, in fact, seen new males that were not natal males, new males come into these groups. We have never witnessed a new male coming from outside in these groups. <clears throat> the other aspect is what happens with the males? Do they stay all the time in these groups? No, not necessarily. So in these groups, um, occasionally males disappear. By disappear, I mean that um, one day you come and a male is gone, is no longer there, and you never see him again. This is opposed to males leaving and then we find them somewhere else later again. This is called an emigration. And if you look at these um, situations here in our study groups, you find that in these two groups we had males disappear. We don't know what happened to these males. right? So all of a sudden, one day, the males were gone. Maybe this was predation. Maybe they left. We don't know. But in two cases here, and it's important to note, in these two cases, we had emigrations. What is important here that this was not only one male, but these were multiple males leaving a group. Right? So in this case, um, there were actually four males altogether leaving a group. So. these four males formed new groups. So the situation we had here was that from two of the groups, from this group and from this group, PS, PO, four males left, and then they stayed nearby in the forest area, and some time later, some months later, other females, not from their original group, females joined them so that they had two new groups in the forest. And after some time, they had carved out new areas in the forest. So going back to the predictions. So we found that natal males stayed. But they didn't stay for some time. They stayed in their natal group. So in a way, you can call them phylopatric. Right? In addition, we had no takeovers, as predicted for uh, age graded multi-male groups, we had never had a takeover, we never had actually a male, a new male coming from outside, and we also saw the formation of new groups. So these two predictions do not work out for age graded multi units. Now the last characteristics are the social relationships among these males. So for age graded multi units, you would expect that the males are some kind of, show some kind of tolerance to each other. And in addition, you expect that at the top of the dominance hierarchy, there is the oldest male, supposedly the father of the other males. Um, now, this is not what we found. If 
these males, they can be tolerant, and I'll show you later. But they are really nasty to each other within these groups. This male here on the left lost an eye during a fight. So he doesn't have his left eye. Uh, this is a subadult male at this time, and he was really beaten up severely. And guess what? Is what we know from genetic data that this is his father who beat, who beat him up. Right? So these males are having severe fights. They sometimes have severe injuries. And this happens especially at the time when these subadult males mature, when they become adult, especially around this time you see these fights. Now, with regard to um, dominance rank, we also did not find the, expected, find the expected pattern of the oldest male being on top. Instead, it's the very young, in their prime age, those males are on top of the hierarchy. And so this is one example. I could show you more examples, but this is one example that really demonstrates the case. So in 2004, you had in this group, PA, you had four males. You had two adult males on top of the hierarchy, and then below them, two juvenile males. In 2005, the only change, these two males swapped the rank. This male had become subadult. And then, still as a subadult, this male could outrank one of the adult males. And then, towards the end of 2006, this male had become young adult and now was at the top of the dominance hierarchy, outranked two older adult males. So what you find here is a pattern that is not really the oldest male on top, but a young adult male is on top of the hierarchy. And as I said, we had several examples of this. Um, now, these males are not always aggressive, and they're not always competitive. They also have some kind of a soft side, if you want. Um, and what you see in this species is that males occasionally carry infants around, even young infants, very young infants. So they have some kind of male care for infants. And um, if you look at this chart here, they seem to prefer to care for male infants as opposed to female infants. And these males occasionally form male-male friendships. And you see here a male and a young male, an adult male and a juvenile male huddling together. And you see these friendships between older males and younger males quite frequently. And what is, from my perspective, really something that is very unusual is that if a male is injured, he stays in the group and is tolerated in that group. If you go to other species, if you take Hanuman Langers, a male is in, has injuries from a fight, he leaves and only comes back when he's healthy again. This didn't happen in the species. The males get injured, and then once the fight is over, the fight is over. Right? And then the other male is tolerated. So it's not that these are not tolerant. It's not that these are only competitive. It's both. Right? So they are competitive and they are tolerant at the same time. It's not a dichotomy. You have not one or the other, but you have both in this species. So if you look at the social relationships, the social relationships also do not work out in terms of this age-graded multi-male units. The social relationships, the males are competitive and tolerant, not only tolerant. And if you look at the top of the hierarchy, it's not the oldest male, but it's a young adult male that is at the top of the hierarchy. And these are the young males at the height of their strength and physical power. So if you look at this, exceptions from the rule number two, then there's only very, very little left. Right? So this is not only our study, but also other people have looked at other species like gorillas. And if you look at this, exception from the rule, the age-graded multi-mount units. What we know about primates, the only species that really has this kind of a system are Thomas's Langers. And there, we know this. It's clear that they have an age-graded male system, but this is so far the only species that has this kind of a system. So what are they? Right? They are not female defense polygyny. 
They're not H-graded multimer groups, so what are they? So here we come back to our exceptions of the rule number one. We come back to the cooperative resource defense polygyny. And so when we had these results, and we said, well, wait a second, what could they be? Maybe they are a little bit like chimpanzees. And so we tried to find this out in looking at um, the territorial behavior uh, of this species. So we're looking at intergroup encounters and territoriality. And here you have the home ranges of three of all four study groups. Um, and these home ranges are 0.4 to 1.2 square kilometers in size. Now, this is not really important. What is important is the, the number below this. They have only 3 to 6% overlap, these home ranges. So this means that a group has access to an area of, of, of its area 79 to um, 70, 97 to uh, 94, sorry, 97 to 94 percent of its area is exclusive access. So if you go in the forest there, you can draw a line in the forest, and the, the monkeys go probably a little bit, 20, 30 meters across this border, but they're not going deeply into the area of the other group. It's really like borders in the forest that you can't really see. So these are really territories. Um, and the interesting thing is that multimal units have larger territories. So first of all, if you look at this uh, relationship, you can see that with group size, home range size is increasing. So that's not really surprising. If you have more individuals in a group, you should have a larger home range because you have more mouths to feed. Uh, so you should have more food. You should have a larger area. But the multimal unit has a larger home range than the one male units. So the idea is maybe the multimal unit is stronger and can defend more, a bigger, better um, home range territory. So that brings us to the encounters. And do they actually defend these areas? And we have um, encounters one every five days. So all the groups have neighbors. They have between three and six neighboring groups. And we have about one to uh, one in five days we have an encounter. And almost all of these encounters are antagonistic, meaning that they're chasing each other. Right? And if this is antagonistic, 100% of the time, it's males chasing other males. And females are almost never involved in these. They're bystanders. They're looking, they're sitting there, doing nothing. Right? Uh, it's the males who chase each other. And if you have these chases in a third of these chases, these were multiple males attacking the males from the other group. So it's clear that there's antagonism between the groups. These groups defend territories. Now, last but not least, um, when we looked um, at the border area use, so these are the hatched areas here. These are border areas. This is an arbitrary 100 meter uh, border that we draw on our maps. And we looked at how these groups were using the border areas, whether they were using them frequently or infrequently. And the interesting thing is that the all male units avoiding areas close to neighboring groups, whereas the multimal units do not. So multimal units go everywhere in their territory. One male units seem to avoid the border areas. So we haven't looked in all details, but um, we haven't particularly looked at individual benefits. We have looked at group level benefits, potential group level benefits. Um, so there's more things that we need to do. But given these results, we thought, well, it seems to be better to live with multiple males together in a group because these groups have more area and seem to be better able to defend their resources. So it might be beneficial to live in groups with multiple males. So in all these species with cooperative male resource defense, it seems that there are two main issues. So this is sort of the takeaway message. 
male tolerance seemed to help in joint defense of resources. And males and females in these species might actually benefit from uh, this behavior. This does not mean that these males are all tolerant and all buddies. These males are still very competitive. You can see this in chimpanzees, you can see this in fierce leaf monkeys, you can see this in other species. Um, so competition is there still, but they need each other, and so to a certain degree they are being tolerant. Now, as I said in the beginning, this people suggest that, well, maybe this occurs in chimpanzees. Nowadays, we know that this seems to occur in many other species as well, not only in chimpanzees and fierce leaf monkeys, but also in many other species. And if you know a little bit about primates, then you will realize that these are lion tamarins, tamarins, capuchin monkeys, and spider monkeys are all new world monkeys from different families, from different subfamilies. Then we have mangabees, guanins, guarezas, and chimpanzees. These are all African primates from different families, uh, different subfamilies. And then we have furious leaf monkeys and gibbons that also seem to defend resources. So you have this, not only is this more common than suggested previously, but you have it in all major primate radiations, maybe to the exceptions of lemurs and lorises. Right? But in all other primate radiations, you have this. So then, of course, the obvious question is, why do some species have cooperative resource defense polygyny and others don't? Well, no idea. Um, this would be a really good question. It would be great to find out, but more seriously. Um, this is one of the key questions that people, in my opinion, have to address in the future. It's the question of what are the predictors of male cooperative resource defense polygyny. Right? So what are the predictors of mating systems among primates, particularly this particular mating system? In addition, the other question, and I didn't talk about this really, uh, is the collective action problem. I talked a little bit about group level benefits, but I did not talk about individual benefits from this. And this is one key question that people have to address, and also the question of how to control free riders, because if two males do something, then the third male could stay back and do nothing. How can you control free riders in such a system? And with this, I have to thank many people for their very nice pictures, because some of these pictures were mine, but most of them were not. Um, and I have to thank uh, various funding resources, uh, sources, because without them we couldn't have done this project. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. And of course, I take questions. <laughs> yeah. So are these strategies uh, inflexible, or are they flexible? Um, I'm trying to think of an example. <clears throat> I would say they are flexible. It depends really on the situation. Um, males may stay, for example, males may stay in a group um, for some time and really be the, the, the omega male in a group um, after they have been beaten. Um, and then they think of something else and go and find another group or um, form another group. So in, in some situation, males stayed for a long time in a group and um, were not really on top of a hierarchy, and then finally they made their way up. So some, some males that were not young adult also became alpha males. Um, so there is some flexibility in there. I would say that um, from the males, I would say that the females are much more flexible. Um, um, because females, I didn't mention this before, females in this species um, disperse. So females are, they are not maturing in the natal group. You had one female in all these years, one female staying in the natal group. And we're pretty sure that her father was no longer there. Um, 
And so she could stay um, in terms of inbreeding avoidance. This, was, this wasn't a problem. Females really go, if they don't like a particular group, then they leave and go to another group. So they change groups multiple times over their lifetime. And so from that perspective, I think we had some males that were quite flexible, but I would say in general, females are more flexible. Yeah. I wish I could say that. Um, okay, um, we can only go by disappearances because the few events that we have seen, um, so we saw one event, a marble cat preying on a juvenile male. Um, we had one incident where we were not there, uh, but we found the head of a male. Um, so fortunately, should say that. For, well, because we could see the muzzle and so the eye rings and so on, we could identify the male. And it looked like it was um, preyed upon by a clouded leopard. <clears throat> and we had seen in the same area, we had seen two clouded leopards before. So, but these are the only cases where we can be sure that these animals were preyed upon. The other cases are disappearances, and we don't know. Disappearance can mean a ton of things. So I, I wish I could answer that question, but I can't. Right. Yeah? Um, in general, it depends on how adverse the environments are. So it doesn't really matter what the type of, of adversity is. If it's an adverse environment, then, or this is at least the theory, this, this is the idea, that if you have adverse environments, then you would cooperate, right? So then you have to find out which of the environments is more adverse than the other, which is if you, if you compare apples and oranges, it's, it's becoming really difficult, right? So I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Type of responses. <laughs> um, okay, um, so that depends on the audience. Um, so if you go to universities, public audience, and so on and so forth, people are usually very interested in this type of research, um, up until the point when you talk a little bit more about the conditions in the forest, and people are uh, thinking, well, I wouldn't do this. Um, but generally, people are very interested. If you, if you go more on the political, uh, in the political arena, if you go to let's say senators and congressmen, um, then there's very different react or there's varied reactions, let's put it that way. So um, some congressmen, senators think this is a waste of money. Uh, others like it. So, so you have both. Uh, through aggression, through fights. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I could put up the dominance matrices and the dominance data. Uh, this is much easier to understand. So um, the males at some point challenge the older males, right? And then if, if the males give way, then okay, then, then it's done. Then it's a very simple dominance approach, retreat interaction. And at some point, then the dominance, um, the, the rank switches. Uh, if the older males do not give way, then it comes to fights. And I showed you the one um, 
with a with a with a red neck, <laughs> so injured neck. This was some months later. He fought his fa his father again, and then he succeeded, and then he became the alpha male. And then this male, uh, this was Group PS. This male stayed for another year. The the, the defeated male stayed for another year, and then he and three other males left and formed a new group. So this is the, the case where you think, well, why didn't he go in immediately? Uh, but he stayed on for a year, and then at some point he left. Yes? Uh, do you see then a, a relationship between the dominant male and the frequency with which they get their sexual encounters and opportunities to make? Uh, yes. Um, and I'm a little hesitant because we're currently analyzing these data. So we're currently analyzing these data. So I'm a little, yes, I think there is, we have also genetic data and we think there is a relationship between dominance rank and reproduction and fitness. So the higher ranking males have more offspring than the lower ranking males. Yeah, that would be easy to predict. That's what would, yeah, yeah. Know, that would be driving this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we're analyzing these data right now. And uh, we think that during this period of uncertainty, um, we, I don't know whether we have enough data for this, but during a period of uncertainty when it's not clear whether who's the higher ranking male, uh, that you have a more even uh, reproductive skew, whereas um, during the time when you have a stable period where there's a clear dominant rank, dominance, ma dominant male, that you have a stronger reproductive skew among the males. That's that's the that's the idea, but we can't <clears throat> we can't really know because the two groups that were formed new um, we didn't observe these groups groups so we can't uh, we followed them a little bit of time and we also had then seen there are new females coming in and we didn't know these females so they were not from our groups uh, but we didn't really follow them regularly we only occasionally encountered them and then. Uh, we did some, some chance observations, basically. Yeah? Did dominant males have any uh, resource benefits besides potential access? And did you also look at whether resources impacted any of the migration of males in or out of the um, So for the males, um, we don't know what the individual benefits are. We're trying to find out reproduction, what the individual benefits are. In terms of food, um, we have to wait a little bit. I have one graduate student who is currently, she has nutritional data, um, and she has, yeah, she has nutritional data, and she has the plant content data. And at some point, she will know whether the males have different energy gains from energy intake. Uh, but um, I don't know. That's the answer, the short answer. Yes? In the paper that you sent to us, yeah. um, the populations of all four groups were um, much fewer males than females in all four groups. Um, I was wondering why is that? Where do all the males go? Well, really good question. Excellent. How would it affect the social system? <clears throat> um, it, I think it affects the social system. Um, so first of all, uh, there is a skew in birth sex ratio. So there is fewer males born than females. This is a very odd finding, but uh, this is the case. And we have, so usually if you uh, analyze birth sex ratios, you should not come up with any conclusions before you have 100 births. Uh, we have 105 or 108. So we can be pretty sure that we are safe to say that there's a skew in birth sex ratio. There are much more females born than males. So this is one factor. Um, the second factor is that my wife actually says, well, in the night, they kick each other from the branch and kill each other. Right? So we have, we have these males disappearing. Well, no, it could be a very simple explanation. So the males are potentially driven out of these groups. 
So you have, so let's start at the beginning. So males get into fights and they injure each other. And we had one male breaking his leg and he disappeared. So yeah, it's a fatality from a fight. Um, that happens, definitely. And we have never seen this for females. Then the other thing is, um, this could be due to dispersal. So males disappear from these groups. And as I said, we have lots of predators in the area. And maybe when they go, when they leave a group, because they're sort of driven out in a way, then they leave and they have no way in getting into another group. They live on their own. And maybe they're caught by a predator at some point. Um, and females seem to avoid this in that they quite often switch groups during intergroup encounters. We had this multiple times. That females, sometimes females show up in a group all of a sudden, um, but quite often groups meet, and then during this encounter, one female from one group moves into another group. And so then they do not have a time alone in the forest. They're always with a group. And this reduces, or at least potentially reduces, the risk of predation. Right. So maybe there's a different predation risk for, for males. And there's, of course, the fights that, that may impact as well. Right. Yeah? What is the difference in the first difference? What's the large difference? Um, the difference, if I don't quote me on this, um, you have about it's in the 60s for the females and it's less than 40 for the males right so it's it's about one third to two thirds but it's it's probably a little bit more than one third yeah can you talk a bit of Um, so the challenge is to get enough money. <laughs> um, to have a field project, and I mentioned this before, to have a field project like this, we, I haven't shown these pictures, we had a field station there. Um, so we had, with help from NSF, support from NSF, built a field station there, a permanent field station. And you have permanent people there. We had permanently four to five to six people working there, plus students. Uh, that costs you about between thirty and fifty thousand a year, um, and you have to find the money for this. Right, so it's challenging to get the money. That's number one. Number two is the um, continued struggle with administering such a field site in terms of permits. Um, so you have to have permits for research. You have to have permits for entering this area. In Thailand, you have to have permits for collecting plant samples. You cannot bring out plant samples all over the country. Um, you have to collect, um, you have to have permissions for collecting fecal samples to do DNA analysis or, or hormone analysis and these kind of things. Um, and then if you have succeeded in doing this, then you have to bring the samples from Thailand to the United States, where you have your labs, and uh, Thailand belongs to the H1 and 5 countries, so you can't just ship this uh, because this is hazardous material. Uh, so it's, it's, these are challenges that you have. Plus, um, not everybody likes to work in this environment, so we had volunteer assistants, and um, some volunteer assistants come and leave after two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. You have to replace these people. So it's the whole administration of this thing is, is um, difficult. And this, is, this was for me, I was in the end mainly administrator. Right? So I didn't, do, I didn't go in the forest and watch monkeys in the end. Um, so the reward is, in my opinion, being in the forest and being with these animals. And if you have a long-term study, uh, really getting sample sizes that other people do not have. So we have, uh, as I said, we have 108 or 105 births observed. So we have, um, in the end, we will have probably the DNA for 70 infants. So we can 
do the paternity for 70 infants, which is a huge number in primates, right? Not if you go to birds or something, right? Uh, not. But so this is rewarding because you can draw from a big pool of data. It's not one year of behavioral observation data, but it's 23 years of behavioral observation data. Right? So that's rewarding because you find something uh, um, good, hopefully. And as I said, being for me, being out in the forest is really nice. You, are, you always are reminded that you are a guest in this forest. Uh, because you are with elephants and tigers and leopards and bears and snakes and whatnot. And, of course, I should not forget gazillions of mosquitoes. Yeah. Thank you. Can you be a little bit more specific? Um, so you talked about different kinds of systems. Oh, okay. You know, the mentalism, um, the atrial male system. What systems do you think is most prevalent in humans? Think about pre versus... Okay. Um, this is really, really difficult because I'm... Um, if people would be a little bit more straightforward with their reconstruction of sexual size dimorphism in, in, in hominins, then you could be a little bit more straightforward with uh, an answer about sort of ancestral mating systems. Right? So, but um, talk to two paleoanthropologists and you get three opinions about sexual size dimorphism. Now, um, coming from research on sperm in humans and non-human primates, humans, contemporary humans, fall in between one male units and multi-male units. Right? So in terms of um, sexually very dimorphic species like gorillas and a less dimorphic species with multi-male units like macaques and chimpanzees and so on, so from that perspective, um, you have, I tend to think that a ancestral condition is probably a multi-male, multi-male, multi-female multi unit, right? Um, so I don't think that people like Owen Lovejoy are correct in assuming a long-standing monogamous pattern, right? I don't think so. I think there are, from all what we know, Males have relatively strong polygynous tendencies, um, and females in most primates are certainly polyandrous. So a multi-male, multi-female system as an sort of ancestral condition at some point in hominin evolution makes the most sense to me. Um, in, if you look at many, well, there's a, there's a big shift with agriculture in mating systems, right? So it, it has agriculture, farming, um, um, keeping animals, and so on and so forth, pastoralism, has changed the human system dramatically. Um, and um, so this is a cultural change <clears throat> that occurred moving towards a more polygynous system which then becomes, in my opinion, more monogamous, also a cultural thing. Um, what was the condition before polygyny? Um, if you come from the dispersal perspective, so if you just look at dispersal and what people have reconstructed in the last years, also from genetics, then we have a much more matrilineal system or a system with both males and females dispersing, which, if you go to primates and comparative 
studies of primates, these are both um, multi-male units as well as one male multi-female multi units. Right? So uh, definitely not monogamous. Right? So monogamy is, I, I see, and if you look at some of the recent um, analysis from Laura Facinato, um, then you can trace, you can sort of try to trace back monogamy in the cultural evolution of humans some time back, but it's not really going back very far. Right. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.